Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Georgia chapter of HFMA. I am Jacqueline Massey with Craneware, and I'm on the Georgia HFMA webinar committee. Now, we're excited to present today's webinar entitled Complex Claims Billing for Hospitals, Five Steps to Success. Now, before we get started, I would like to review just a few housekeeping items. Um, first of all, all lines will be muted to avoid any interruptions during the broadcast. Secondly, later this week, today's presentation will be uploaded um, onto the Georgia HFMA website under the tab titled, In Case You Missed It. Um, thirdly, everyone on the today's call is eligible to receive continuing education credits for participating. Now, I will email everyone a CPE form, and then if you if you don't receive it um, later on today after today's after today's um, presentation, um, you can just email me Jacqueline Massey at j massey at cramer com, and I will also enter this in my um, email information into the chat line so that everyone will have it. And then also you will receive a copy of the slide presentation for today's um, webinar. Now, at the conclusion of today's webinar, we'll have a Q&A session, and then you may submit your questions in the question box at any time during the presentation, just so that you don't forget the question that you may have had. And our speaker will address, our speakers today will address all of the questions at the end of the presentation. So for today's presentation, it is my pleasure to welcome Allie Connor from Enable Corporation. So at this time, I'll turn the presentation over to you, Allie. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm excited to be able to introduce our speakers from EnableComp today. Uh, Jason Smart is our Senior Director of Complex Claims, and Jesse Larison serves as our Vice President of Account Management. Um, <clears throat> Jason is our subject matter expert for motor vehicle accident claims. Prior to joining EnableComp, Jason worked as a staff attorney for seven years, with the Revenue Cycle Management Corporation in Florida, representing numerous hospitals and hospital chains against health insurance, workers' compensation, and motor vehicle insurance carriers. Jason then joined CHS Community Health Systems as their vendor operations manager for four years. Jesse Larson joined Enable Comp in 2013 to establish a managed care department, which is responsible for administering all state and federal fee schedules, payer contracting, clinical review, and regulatory management. Prior to EC, Jesse worked at Corvell Corporation and oversaw all departments in his district from sales, claims administration, nurse case management, medical billing, and provider contracting. But between the two of them, they have over 30 years of work comp experience. I'm pleased to have them with us today to provide education and best practice tips to our hospital billing departments in Georgia, as well as sharing a few key points with us that will help us all tame the complex pay classes and be more profitable in the process. But before we jump into the details, I would like to introduce Ken Green, our Vice President of Client Services, to briefly explain who we are and what we do. Welcome, everybody. It's nice to see so many people from Georgia and friends and, and partners uh, alike. I'd also like to take a moment just to thank our, our friends from HFMA Georgia for sponsoring this, this event. So we really appreciate them doing that for us. Um, as Ali said, I'm just going to take a minute just to go through this one slide, to introduce who Enable Comp is, and we'll give you a little bit of backstory on us and then we'll ju jump into the meat of the matter. So Enable Comp is a, is a full service provider for revenue, revenue cycle management. We uh, focus on what we call the complex claims arena, which is listed up there as workers comp, motor vehicle, and veterans administration. Um, currently we have 800 partners today nationwide and that number continues to grow weekly, monthly. Um, a lot of folks ask me, what, what's the key to your success? And really it's driven around two things. It's the technology, which is a proprietary software we've uh, built over the last 18 years, and of course our highly skilled uh, team members. And the second question I often get asked is, what does success look like uh, from an EnableCom point of view? And there's really three, really three factors that we judge ourselves and get judged on by, by a number of our partners. First one, of course, is the, the highest return value possible on each individual claim. The second one would be getting full payment um, within 90 days, and if not, why not? And then, of course, the last and, and equally most important is uh, reducing our overall AR for you folks. So those are the three things that typically we um, we see as the high points for the for the partner agreements, and also things that we judge ourselves on internally. 
Um, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to have a slide up where you can reach out and contact me for any further information or questions about this presentation. So with that, Jesse, I'll let you take it over. Sure. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Allie, Jackie, appreciate it. So welcome, everyone. Um, I think what I'd like to do is when we begin these type of presentations that get into specifics around complex claims is give a little bit of context. I think it goes a long way with understanding kind of where we are today and why do these best practices make sense and uh, if you don't understand what the starting point was. Um, and, you know, since complex claims are really an unknown commodity to a lot of people in the building world, even those kind of in the expert role, uh, let's just talk a little bit about what they are, how we got here, um, and, and what we need to do to get really good at it. So everything started with, with talking about work comp specifically, and Jason, you're going to talk about the MBA story, but work comp started about 130 years ago in Germany. Um, Chancellor at that time had a mandatory state-run accident compensation program, which was really unique in the world at the time. Uh, and it was a system that was set up that injured workers got paid for 13 weeks, and it was a fund that paid those benefits was shared by the workers and the employers. So it, was, it worked really well. It was unique. And in the United States, there was nothing like that at the time. Um, there were some voluntary laws in place around the country, but it really wasn't until the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in 1911, which was a terrible tragedy, and it killed over 120 people in New York, that New York and many other states decided to change the laws that were on the books to make room for the beginnings of work comp legislation. By 1930, almost every state had had something put on the books as far as work comp reform. In 1948, the last state, Mississippi, joined the ranks to really create work comp, which was the first uh, national social insurance program. It predated Medicare and Medicaid, so it was very revolutionary. Now, fast forward to today, we call work comp the grand bargain. Um, grand bargain really just basically means, you know, you take care of my work injury, Mr. Employer, and I won't sue you for negligence. That's kind of the deal. And uh, typically, the system works very well. Uh, it gives employees the confidence to show up to work, do potentially really dangerous things. Um, but it also focuses on the employer's motivation to spend time on accident prevention, safety, all those kind of things that are really important to keep their employees safe. So the program has since come from, you know, the early 1900s, to over 3 million work comp claims annually. It's a $92 billion system just in benefit payout. Um, so it has really rapidly changed just in a short amount of time in our, in our nation's history. MVA has a similar story, right, Jason? Thank you for that brief history, Jesse. Um, to understand more about where we've come from, from a, an insurance standpoint, we look no further than looking at Ben Franklin. Uh, he founded the Philadelphia Contribution Ship as the first insurance care, uh, company, basically, in, in uh, 1750. Um, it's still alive today. If you still want to go get a policy, you can. Um, I just wouldn't read the Yelp reviews, though. Um, so from the, 17, the 1700s to about 1870, that's when we have uh, the horse-drawn carriage in this country. We don't have an engine. Uh, we started developing the engine in the 1870s. Uh, it's not until 1897 when uh, Gilbert L. Loomis uh, has the first car that is insured by travelers. At the time, it was considered a mechanized uh, buggy policy. So it's not even really car insurance yet. Uh, it would turn into car insurance in 1898 when Dr. Truman Martin uh, from Buffalo, New York, purchased the first uh, automobile insurance policy in, uh, from travelers as well. So now that we have the, the cart, now we're able to actually move to insuring the cart. And then other regulations behind that cart occur in 1925 in Connecticut. That's when the state legislature thought too many people were getting in accidents and they weren't having enough coverage, weren't having enough support. So in essence, the legislature thought we need to protect them. So they instituted the first compulsory idea behind insurance. So as long as you could prove that you could financially support your first accident, they'd let you have your car or they'd let you at least purchase it. So that was a great idea, and, and that filtered to Massachusetts in 1931. Um, that's when Massachusetts thought, we're not getting enough money from our, uh, we need to actually create more money, more opportunity for our people, uh, a way to find them, so to speak. So in Massachusetts, they instituted the first compulsory law. So if you actually had car insurance, you had to prove that you, um, if you actually had a car, you had to prove that you could buy car insurance. So at that time, 
you could not support your car insurance, you could not buy the car. If you were found to have bought the car without insurance, you were fined. So that's a little way, a little bit of how they were able to create value uh, for their people. Um, and then we're going to stay with Massachusetts and then move into the 1970s. And that's when they introduced the idea of no fault insurance. Uh, the legislature at that time believed that their citizens were not getting adequate coverage. or So they passed the first version of no fault in 1971, meaning courts did not matter in the uh, application of fault. As soon as you got into an accident, your insurance could pay for your benefits up to a certain limit. So that's how we've gotten to no fault insurance today. Um, and finally, just a, a quick snapshot of two statistics that really paint what MBA is today. Uh, in 2010, the CDC estimated that accident claims cost us approximately $99 billion in repairs, medical care, property loss, productivity loss, and any other associated costs with it. Um, and then also in 2016, the Traffic Safety Association reported approximately 6.3 million uh, police report police reported MBA crashes. So they're actually thinking that there's another 10 million that did not come out as reported. So it, it's amazing to see the the amount of chaos and carnage that comes from a car that's not reported and how much uh, there is behind it to ensure it. Uh, I appreciate that, Jason. I think now we're going to uh, put a poll up to talk a little bit about complex claims. Jackie, if you want to go ahead and uh, launch the poll. Yes, I have already opened up that poll for you, and we're collecting responses now. So what's one word that describes complex claims to you? We hear a lot of different words, Jason and I, uh, Allie, on uh, complex claims. Uh, love it or hate it, uh, it kind of garners a, a varied uh, response from our client base, uh, but there are certainly some similarities out there. I'd love to hear what, what you all think as well. Okay, so the majority of our um, attendees um, have put complex is the one word that describes <laughs> to you. That's the word we use. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's good, so I would say that's accurate. Well, I, I'll say this. Uh, we would agree with that. Uh, we see, we see. Um, obviously, complex claims is a headache for most of our most of our clients. Um, and one of the reasons that we get involved is to try and make it uh, a little bit simpler through our processes. And you know, the interesting thing when you talk about work comp specifically, Jason, is it's really a massive entitlement program, um, and it's not federally regulated. It's very strange to have something this big without any kind of federal oversight. It's a giant state-run program. Every state's different in how they handle work comp, uh, and the rules change from one state to another with respect to things like how claims are submitted, how injuries are reported, um, you know, what services need to be pre-certified before hospitals get paid. So it's very confusing. Um, you know, what, what does your state say about expected reimbursement? How does Georgia look at it from a revenue standpoint? Some states are pretty lucrative for hospitals and others really barely pay the costs for uh, common treatments like physical therapy, radiology, and things like that. So, you know, unless you're in a health system that's spanning multiple states, you don't really need to learn all the rules and regulations for the entire Southeast or, or 50 states where you could potentially get some out-of-state claims. Uh, you can focus strictly on the ones that impact the majority of your patient volume here in Georgia. Uh, but learning, you know, learning those things is really required in order to kind of develop the work operating cycle. Uh, and for MVA, you know, similar to and that not a lot of common ground, right, Jason? That's right, Jesse. There's um, when you look at each state, there's absolutely no correlation between one work comp and then their MVA type of uh, uh, law. So some states have the same setup where they might have the same work comp law and the same MVA law, but there's no guarantee that's always going to happen that way. But taking our current audience, Georgia, they're utilizing uh, DRG and Medicare. Uh, for their work comp. Uh, if you look at their MBA laws, uh, they have a strict lien law uh, with no PIP. So there is absolutely no correlation. If you look at that map, it's completely uh, together. I mean, 
the states have their own way of doing it. So on our next slide, we're going to see what's commonly reported as our uh, payer mix. Yeah. You know, we, we call it the neglected pay classes, right? And, and the reason they are is because obviously when you take a look at the amount of business that most of you on the call deal with on a regular basis, you know, these complex claims represent the smaller share. Uh, you know, work comp and motor vehicle together may only be two to four percent of your entire AR. And then if you look at how this class might drain your resources, you want your staff uh, making that single phone call to resolve as many counts as possible. Uh, in work comp, that's possible after validating the employer uh, reported accident and then confirming the carrier and the adjuster. Uh, with motor vehicle, unfortunately, you may talk to the carrier, the adjuster, the patient, their attorney the third party carrier and that third party adjuster and still have multiple calls to make. Yeah, and you know, it, it's it's hard to keep up with the rules, especially when they're ever changing out on the comp side. You know, Georgia updates their fee schedule every year. They just dropped the new fee schedule in April. Um, so if, you're, if your team uh, is purchasing those fee schedules for fair health and uploading into your system, great. Uh, that's really key to be successful. They also released an update um, for the original fee schedule that got dropped on April 1 with changes. So, you know, we're, we're less than two weeks into the new fee schedule and there's already revisions being released. So uh, things that are changing constantly on the comp, comp side as well, especially in Georgia. Uh, hospitals are also going to be outgunned sometimes. Uh, carriers from each side of the insurance spectrum are going to have multiple lobbying firms. Uh, they've construed the regulations in their favor. Uh, they have a DIN or a firm waiting for a uh, waiting to strike any type of issue that might come up, and they have shareholders to keep happy. Um, hospitals lack that firepower constantly to combat all the dirty tricks insurance carriers use against them. Uh, you want your finite resources and budgets for patient care and revenue generation, not suing insurance carriers for bad faith or pursuing a patient for a coordination of benefits form. You, you know, Jason, I don't think the carriers call it dirty tricks. I think they use the term cost containment uh, is what I've heard it uh, phrased as, but it's basically the same basic thing, right? How do I not pay my hospital bill, right? Correct. So when you look at the, the ways to be successful in handling complex claims, you can take a look at five key points. We, we call them the five basic questions. And right, these things address this cost containment. And, you know, the carrier community, they spend billions of dollars every year on looking for ways to not pay the hospitals. Okay, so they are putting a ton of money into this cost containment engine, and there's a return on investment for them, right? So the dollars they put into their cost containment programs, that's five, ten, whatever dollars that they don't have to pay to our Georgia partners. Uh, and this, the, it's the goal of kind of this webinar uh, to really share some of those tips with you all on how to get some of that money back that's rightfully due to you. You know, because we understand you're at a disadvantage because the carriers uh, may be better informed, they may have better tools, they may have dedicated staff focused solely on these type of claims. Uh, I know they do. So, you know, the question that we're going to ask ourselves is, can we win at this process? There isn't a lost cause. And it really the answer is not if you can put together some basic tenets of success. Um, and that is really asking the basic questions like, you know, where do I need to send my complex bills? Where do they go? That's the first thing. Second thing is, how do I get paid? I know specifically how I'm going to get paid. Uh, not just send it and guess. Um, you know, when I'm going to send the bill, how do I? There's a process on how to send these bills properly. Uh, and then once you identify what those three operational questions are, the second part is to really win on the CBO side is, how am I measuring my success? And am I winning or losing at it? And do I need to keep it? Or do I need to find a partner? Those five questions are really the ones that every one of our CBO partners should have to be asking themselves to identify, hey, how do I, am I successful in managing this complex claims environment? And, uh, and, and can, I, can I prove that internal? Um, and so with that, let's kind of get to the next poll question. And I guess this is uh, one of the questions that, that always amazes us when, when, when we talk to our clients about complex claims being go to right place. My question to the group here is, what percentage of complex claims do go to the right place? What do you think? Is it most of them? Is it half of them? Jackie, if you want to open the poll, let's see what we get. Yeah, the, yes, the poll is open, and we are almost 30 seconds um, into the polling, and you're going to be surprised <laughs> at the numbers we're going to have here. 
So I'm closing the poll, and what we have is um, we have 27% said A for the 25%, 36% answered B, and 27% answered C, and we had 9% that answered D. Good. Well, it looks like we're all over the place, right? And I think that's in line with the type of responses that we normally get, right, Jason? Absolutely. So, you know, the first statistic that really strikes us, Allie, if you want to move on to the next slide, is that, uh, you know, 35% of, of claims go to the right place. Right. I'm mean, uh, looking at 65 going to the wrong place, right, Jason? Absolutely. Um, that single action of getting it to the right payer at the right time, that's, that's a huge, huge win for you. If you get it to the wrong place, that's going to have a delay of anywhere from 30 to 45 days before they're going to deny it. And then you're going to have to start your process all over again. Um, and then with that lengthy payment delay, having that exponentially for every claim that you've sent to the wrong carrier, that's going to hurt your bottom line. Um, and then let's pay our, turn our attention to a moment for the phrase that first in time, first in right. Uh, it's meant to simplify a very important aspect of uh, MBA reimbursement. Once your bill is ready, you need to submit it to the correct carrier first, or you're going to run the risk of missing out on payment. Uh, since MBA carriers pay bills as they come in, you want your bill at the front of the line. So you have the possibility of the most reimbursement without having to go through the most hassle. Uh, but once that pool of money is gone for an MBA, uh, first party or third party, it's gone. So you're you need to get that out the door as quickly as possible. Um, and finally, when you're unable to locate that, that correct payer, there's a distinct possibility of losing the opportunity to build that claim at all. Timely filing deadlines continue to shrink. Uh, technology and eligibility vendors continue to find coverage. Carriers rule with an iron fist at the concerns to untimely filing den uh, denials. But if you have that information at the beginning, you've already eliminated one possible denial. Yeah, so the denials obviously is a big issue on the comp side too, right, Jason? Um, both with MBA and, and work comp, you're going to suffer the similar fate by not sending the bill uh, to the right place. So the carriers on the comp side, you know, they're going to return a denied claim that was never get theirs to begin with, and then the delays continue, right? And so, you know, our hospital partners in Georgia are forced to have to investigate who the correct payer is if we're not doing that work for them. They got to track down the payer, address, try and rebill, and hope you haven't already violated the timely filing rules within Georgia. So, uh, getting that that, identific that payer identification on the front end is, is really key to accelerating your cash and eliminating your options. And by not doing it, you know, at best, you're getting paid a lot later than you should, and at worst, you're looking at a complete denial. <laughs> so, I think there's ways that we can solve some of that. Jason, why don't you talk a little bit about our reg the registration piece? So. Starting a registration, it, it bears repeating. It is a vital moment. Uh, when you have that patient in front of you, you want to determine when, where, what, and how the individual ended up in your hospital. Uh, this information drives that encounter through the entire revenue cycle. Uh, if you get it right, you're going to be able to process and get your bill out ready for payment. Uh, if there's a gap in that information, it's going to exponentially affect it. Make sure that you're going to not be able to bill and you might be billing the wrong carrier, wrong time, or just miss out. Um, second point, police reports and passengers. This doesn't really affect work comp, but this is more toward MBA. Uh, in some, and some carriers want to see that police report. They want to see liability. They want to make sure that you were at fault, as a, that you were not at fault, so to speak. And they also want to see what passengers were in the, the car with you, see if there are any attached bills to that particular incident. Um, the carriers either flagged it for potential fraud or there's other foul play that they want to make sure there's not there. Um, also, if those passengers arrive together, you need to determine who was driving and who was riding so that you don't have to rely solely on one piece of paper you have in your system. Uh, once you have all that information together, you can submit the bill and let them review it with all that information and let them make the, the appropriate determination. Um, who is the employer or insurance carrier? Noticeably, this is not really a problem for MBA unless it's an MBA work comp uh, accident, which in turn is a complex claim by itself. But for MBA, it's not really that big of a deal. But for work comp, you want to know who that that employer is. Um, if 
they're in your ER and they're in the middle of getting treatment, you have the opportunity to talk to them, make sure they they relay that information to you so that you're able to go back later on and see who their their work comp carrier is. They And that's going to be a step ahead of where you're going to be without that uh, information. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's going to be, you know, in the ER, the registration department is going to play a key role, right, Jason? You got to ask those key pieces of information. You know, did this injury happen on the job? Who is your employer? If it's ER, you got an unconscious injured worker. You know, who is the supervisor? You got to try and contact the employer, call and see if you can talk to somebody there uh, if the patient's unable to get you that correct information. So, you know, if, if the answer to the question is, yeah, this happened on the job from a work comp standpoint, and the answer is yes, yeah, you got a great likelihood that you're dealing with a work comp claim here. So that's check one off the box. Uh, now you need to get that correct payer information and send that bill and, and authorize, you know, if it's not an ER scenario, um, you know, use state regs. And, you know, most injured workers don't have any idea who their work comp carrier is. I, I'd ask, you know, at the table, do we know who our carrier is? Folks on the call, do you know who your work comp carrier is? But not, maybe. Um, but because we don't know, that means our you know, injured workers that present in our, in our hospitals don't know. Um, especially for scheduled services. So, you know, asking the employer information and then going on to the state website and identifying what it is is a great trick, right? So most states populate this information online. Uh, you just go to the Georgia State Board of Work Comp website, click on that, uh, verify work comp coverage and put in the employer information that your injured worker gave you. And they're going to give you that care information and put you further on down the road to identify, hey, where do I need to send this bill? Uh, we're tying back to that pillar number one. Where does this thing need to go? It's a useful tool published by the state. Uh, I would recommend using it and using it often. Don't forget that key, that key detail of pre-authorizing your uh, non-ER claims. Uh, that's extremely important in work comp. It's also important for MVA if you're getting treatment. Um, but it's always worth repeating that ER services do not require authorization. Um, numerous carriers have tried to deny claims without an auth. Um, I used to deal with that on the phone all the time with insurance carriers, but they got tired of hearing me talk about the uh, EMTALA, which is Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act provisions. So as soon as I would start reading that off to them, they'd go ahead and send it back for reprocessing. Um, Jason, we've come across uh, carriers in other states that have automatic rules to deny ER treatment without pre-auth. So it's amazing to me that some carriers still try and do this as a cost containment. Back to that dirty trick, or you're calling it cost containment. Cost containment. Yep. Yeah, dirty trick. Um, and if you're in the MVA uh, arena, if you have the opportunity to get that case number from the patient, it's great, but it's not that important at that particular moment. But once you're having that treatment done, it, it's vital to have that case number so you're able to reference it back and forth. So moving on to slide 15, you know, when we, the next question we really want to talk about is how do we get paid? Um, you know, for work comp, Jason alluded to, you know, the Georgia fee schedule. We talked a little bit about, about how that works being DRG based inpatient fee schedule uh, with a stop loss provision. Uh, you know, stop loss right now is a contested scenario in Georgia. Some payers are uh, applying um, their own uh, interpretations of, of when they apply stop loss as opposed to just simply the math calculation that's laid out in the fee schedule, which has created some payment variances across certain payers. So understanding how you can pay is important. Uh, and really being able to dig into the, the, the rules around the work on fee schedule is critical. Be able to make these smart appeals. Um, you know, obviously, we, the outpatient reimbursement in Georgia is going to be APC based. They publish tables that are updated every year. But like I said earlier, you know, you got to be prepared to identify those updates as they occur. Uh, like I said, just last week, an update revision was put out. So if you're modeling this in your system um, or uh, training your, your billers, you want to make sure that they stay up to date on the fee schedule. And from an MVA standpoint, Jason, how does Georgia look? So Georgia is actually an at-fault state. Um, and then for their lien law, there are a 60-day uh, notice. After that 60 days is up, they need to file that lien within 15 days. It's a hard deadline. And it's actually considered a traditional type of state where if you file, a, if you have a first-party claim, you can go down that route where first-party health insurance picks up the secondary and anything else might be from the third party or you have the opportunity to sue the third party outright. So it, it's a traditional uh, in that sense. So it's important to know how to get paid, absolutely. And when you take a look at the next question, you know, how do you send those bills? 
it's you know it's important to note that the insurance companies, from a work comp standpoint, they pay the hospital fee schedule about 32% of the time initially, which is not a great ratio if you're looking at uh, how successful you're going to be get uh, getting getting paid based on how hospital bills are set out the door. And if you don't know what to expect, you're just going to spend your wheels appealing payments and miss other opportunities. Um, while some portions of your work comp claims and jurisdictions may fall outside of Georgia, like the Department of Labor and things like that, most of your work comp claims will be within Georgia uh, pursuant to the fee schedule. So it's really important that you understand sending the bill the right way uh, with the things that are absolutely critical to get paid. And that is basically from a work comp standpoint, those medical records. From a work comp standpoint, its records are important. So once you send that bill to the carrier, you've got to send those records along with the consideration to accelerate payment, and it's going to save you from those pending denials. Uh, they're going to come for a lack of documentation that should come with that with that information from a cost standpoint. Not the same for MBA, right, Jason? No, for MBA, I mean, you can attach the medical records. It's going to show some type of liability or some type of history of the accident. But in cases like that, they're going to want to see more extensive uh, medical records to rule out uh, soft tissue damage or pre-existing conditions that happen before that wreck. Um, you also, if you were one on one of the border states, you might want to have uh, your assignment of benefits attached to it to make sure that that payment comes to you, not to the patient. So as long as you, you keep that in mind, and also at the same time, if they have an attorney, you're going to need to filter all of that communication through that party. Make sure that you're uh, involved with that the entire time, or you're going to get left out for any type of settlement. Uh, for lien filing, um, most states do not allow liens on work comp claims. Uh, it's pretty much specifically written in every statute that it does not apply to work comp claims. But for MVA, in some cases, you're able to file a claim electro a lien electronically. Uh, at this time, Georgia is not one of those states that you can do that. It is a paper state. So if you're filing it, you are filing it via certified mail. Um, yeah, so and sending electronically, filing electronically from MVA is, is, is a good thing on a work comp. It's, it, we've seen that electronic submission of work comp claims will generate a faster payment 20% uh, of the time. So, you know, over half of all of our work comp payers uh, can accept claims electronically now. Um, and many can actually pay claims electronically as well, too. So. Uh, if we have the opportunity to submit claims electronically, that's one of the keys to winning on the work off side uh, and eliminating some of those um, uh, payment delays uh, due to the paper uh, paper submission process. Now, you know, when we talk about the different ways of sending bills, how do you do it? What are some of the puts and takes and making sure you're collecting information correctly on the front end, getting in there first in line? Um, you know, the question that we have after that is, how do you tell if you're if you're doing well or not? And from a work comp standpoint, you know there are some metrics that we that we recommend every hospital using to measure success, and uh, that's that's basically because most revenue cycle teams are going to set some kind of billing and collection goal for their other pay classes. And so just because work comp is a smaller piece of the pie doesn't mean it should be free of that type of scrutiny, uh, and then kind of fall under the mismanagement. Uh, fate, uh, which which often happens. So here's a couple of principles that we would recommend that every business office adhere to. So the first thing is days to pay in full. You know, you got to really determine what time frame is reasonable for you to get paid at 100% of what's owed, not just that first payment, but total payment for what you should be getting in Georgia. Um, and then set that goal for well, how do you get that 100%. And, you know, 90 days is kind of what we see as average out there in the marketplace, uh, but 60 days is admirable. Um, it's a good goal to set. MBA is a little bit more difficult, right, Jason? This is going to be a popular refrain for me, but it's tricky due to the number of moving parts. Who knew an attorney could so, could answer a question? I saw that one coming. Though. Uh, pretty much. So if the claim's a really simple ER claim, then it's going to be a lot shorter. But if it's a complex inpatient claim where there are multiple parties, it's going to take a lot longer for you, for that uh, individual to settle out and get all their treatment done and then payment in full to the hospital. Now, when you talk about AR from a work comp standpoint, um, work comp loves to grow and grow and grow and move into that uh, 90 days and beyond bucket. Um, so if you're not committing some boundaries um, for those type of claims, it will get out of hand and your AR is going to look pretty rough for these for those work comp claims. You know, our recommendation is to set your limits at 30%. Um, personally, we, we pursue closer to 20 internally. 
Um, but you know that if you're setting a limit around 20 to 30 percent for AO over 90, you're going to be you're going to be successful at managing that that business. So my second refrain again for MBA, that's tricky. It's just because of all of those moving parts yet again. You might want to be a, you might want to break out those buckets so that you have a first party uh, health insurance, a third party, an attorney bucket. So you're able to really drill down and see what type of timing you're looking at, see what your sweet spot is for payment. Then you might want to keep that internal, uh, internalize that and see if you can get that as a best practice. But then we can look at other uh, KPIs that might be determining factors for you. And it depends on what your organization values. If it's time, if it's money, or if it's the number of FTEs that you've committed to that particular project, uh, you can determine the appropriate measuring stick, but you may need to review that by your collections or the amount of time spent on an account, uh, the number of people it took to resolve that account, or the number of times it took to actually get it paid. Um, through those indicators, you're able to generate a reasonable picture of what your uh, department really wants as a uh, as a measuring stick. Sure, that makes sense. Well, I guess so. If you're asking these questions, and <coughs> you've come all the way to the last part. The last one really is a little bit about self-reflection, right? Right. It's how are we managing this business? Um, are we managing it well? Why is that? Um, questions you want to ask yourself, and, and really, these are they're valid questions, especially when you have one pay class or two pay classes that represent a small amount of revenue. So it's easy to see why in the business offices um, they look to outsource this type of stuff to expert vendors. You know, some rev, some rev some revenue cycle vendors that we've talked to has expressed that they they expend as much as 10% of their entire CBO resources into these complex claims education just because they take that much work and they're only really delivering maybe two to three uh, to six percent of the of the overall revenue. So it, sometimes the, the the cost of actually doing it well versus the return can be out of whack if you don't have um, a really uh, an expert system set up. So depending on what Revenue cycle budget is your goals are. You may want to consider bringing a partner. So you might want to look internally as well to make sure though that entire department is effective at what it's doing. You're going to have to ask your que yourself those questions of: Do these billers and collectors submit timely? Are they going to the correct address? Are they going through the electronic process correctly? Or are they submitting all those claims with the correct information? Um, does your staff follow your uh, standard operating procedure? Do they have the right notes? Are they are they checking every box to make sure they've done everything before they either write it off or close it for uh for no more for, for no more work? Yeah, and so if you're examining kind of the folks that are working the business and identifying you know what is their capability, um, are they overwhelmed? Is it a, an educational resource standpoint? You also want to ask about your systems, the tools you have in place to be successful from a work off standpoint. You know, do you have do you have the ability to model the Georgia fee schedule in your in your system? Are you modeling other states as well? well you talked earlier about border states, Jason. Alabama is probably one of the most lucrative uh, states in the country for work comp. Do we model that system as well too for out of state claims? What about Florida and other surrounding states that may represent uh, you know eight or nine or ten percent of your work comp uh, volume coming from a non-Georgia jurisdiction? Can you handle Department of Labor? What's your process around that? These are the questions you want to ask yourself internally. It's okay. If the answer is no, we don't have solutions for that. It's, you're, you're heading in the right direction toward becoming successful in complex claims adjudication. But what about your PPO contracts? How are they impacting your reimbursement? Are you working closely with your managed care department to understand the volume coming through those uh, managed care contracts? And then, you know, lastly, are you compliant with your state laws around work comp and MBA? Um, there may be some concerns you want to you want to address with your internal compliance department about things that you may not be doing that you should. Um, that, that may create some pain points later on, you know, and then from a reporting standpoint, do, do you even know, do you have the ability to generate reports around your complex claim business to give you and your leadership access to information about where you are in the program and where you're going? So following up more along that line of compliance, along with your liens and your uh, letters of protection, um, if you're close to South Carolina, they don't have a lien, uh, lien law. So you're going to have to even manage that component. In Georgia, since you do have liens, are your staff correctly identifying your threshold? Are they making sure that client, that claim is worth as much money as they think it is, that they're going through the entire process and hassle of, of filing a lien? Do they actually have uh, the required information in the lien? 
do they actually get the confirmation of filing that lien with the court? Um, and in cases where you might have multiple claims for that one patient, are they amended? Or are they refiled appropriately? Or are they keeping evidence of that multiple submission back and forth? Uh, once you dive into these questions, you're going to have an idea of what your process is and what you are missing for compliance. So, you know, I think if you ask yourself those questions um, and you get some good answers, maybe some honest answers about how successful we're being in complex claims, you know, last, the last one is, you know, the goals that I've set for myself, are we, are we meeting those goals? Um, so having a good legal strategy, that type of aspect behind it, um, you're going to have to look internally and make sure you have a good guideline for your settlements, make sure you have a good threshold for it. Um, you're also going to make sure that your percentage that you're not underwater on any particular claim when you are, are, are settling it. Uh, have your local attorneys abused your trust or their national attorneys that are abusing you? Um, do you accept any type of counteroffer? I mean, do you go through the process of only taking one particular settlement offer and then accepting it? Or do you fight for your particular threshold with an iron fist? Uh, you might want to look and see how much give and take you have in that particular area. Uh, do you have a, an adequate command structure in place? Or is it just one person that can accept the settlement? Or are there a group of individuals that can quicken or hasten that acceptance so you're able to get that money in quicker? Uh, and finally, do you want to improve your settlement strategy? Do you have a constant message behind it? Or are you just going ahead and accepting the first thing that comes to you on a whim? So those are those are some interesting questions that you're going to have to ask yourself for that. Sounds like a good legal strategy is uh, is almost is key to uh, winning on the MBA side, right, Jason? Absolutely. So when you identify internally what your legal strategy is, and you're asking your questions uh, about your ability to stay compliant within work comp, you know you got to set those revenue goals we talked about earlier to identify, hey, how are we doing? And asking those questions, we can take advantage of opportunities that exist to capture more revenue. So if you can accelerate, correct, or, or resolve those accounts, you know, with interaction, now you're making the most of that time. And I guess the ultimate question is, does this even work? You know, when you apply these principles, um, what kind of success are we seeing? And, you know, here's a scatter plot here that we've shown, and we've seen this time and time again from a work comp standpoint, it's easy to, to lay out. Uh, and what, what, what happens is when you take a look at, we'll call it kind of an unmanaged program or uh, because um, it's kind of a generic um, uh, billing program treating work comp and uh, in the MBA uh, as just uh, any other type of bill that comes in, specifically looking at the comp piece here, you can see uh, the top payers uh, on in the yellow on the left are really extending out how long it's taking to pay. Uh, the days to pay is, is, is kind of way out there um, above, above 76 days on average. Um, and and total amount of pay to expected. Again, pay to expect is going to be your Georgia fee schedule, your Department of Labor reimbursable amount, uh, whatever it is for those decisions, particular claims. You know, prior to they were about 93% of what they were expected, which really isn't bad if you just look at it without any additional um, um, management. But what's amazing is when you apply some of these basic principles, you see the entire uh, payer uh, experience shift to the right and up on the plot. And what happens is the days to pay actually decreases by almost 18 days overall, which is 23% reduction. And you're seeing almost a 10% spike in reimbursement over, over payment on the work comp side. So you know, this is proof that shows that applying these best practice principles will accelerate cash and will generate um, you know, an increasable amount in reimbursement per claim. Now, when you take a look at measuring your success uh, and the questions we have, we, we kind of come back to those, those five basic questions. You know, where are we sending the bill? Um, how critical it is for us to, to make sure we identify those payers on the front end, right? Correct. And then you want to make sure, how, do I, how am I going to get paid? Um, you want to make sure that you know and understand your work comp fee schedule for the state of Georgia. And you want to make sure that you understand your MBA laws for uh, Georgia. Also, their surrounding areas as well. It's make sure that you're capturing all that revenue. Uh, you also may have specific case law that dictates certain actions, but knowing the overall lay of the land, that's going to be that's going to help you in the long, on the long haul. Yeah. So where, how, how do I, how do I get paid? Uh, and really, how do I actually send that bill out the door? What are the things I need to include with it in order to accelerate my cash and get paid? 
uh, it's critical to do that. Um, and then, Jason, measuring success is important with those KPIs. Absolutely. Your, uh, your KPIs are going to drive your organization's decision making. Uh, it's going to make sure that you're capturing those relevant points for your business's health and not just a canned report or one regression analysis. And that's also going to help you figure out if you need to explore other opportunities, but who knows? Absolutely. You may ask that you may identify these scenarios within your billing group and identify that, hey, I'm hitting on most of these right now and I need to do a few tweaks and refinements to get better. Great. Uh, you may identify that, you know, I don't have the tools needed to be successful or my registration department's not being successful in getting the information I need. I need to bring in an outside vendor to help uh, become more successful. Either way you look at it, <clears throat> identifying these five basic questions, you're going to know whether you're taking your complex claim department to the next level or you're bringing in someone to help you do it um, to be successful. Jason, I think that's kind of the bulk of the presentation we wanted to get into. Uh, I'd love to be able to see if we have some questions that have come through that we might well spend some time um, I'm asking Jackie if we have some questions that we could share with the group. Yes, I um, do have some questions. The first question that I have for you all is, what is the biggest obstacle involving MBA billing? So I'm going to go ahead and take that one. Um, generally speaking, it's the patient. Uh, the patient drives that entire process. Uh, it's either by filling, filing that first party claim, uh, requesting their health insurance be billed or not be billed, hiring an attorney, demanding a third party pay, or if you have any other information, you're going to roll through that billing process. If you lack that information, you're going to need to spend significant resources to make sure uh, you have it on file and then you're able to, to bill it correctly. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question that we have is, what if our work comp bills are denied completely? Well, uh, that happens, doesn't it, Jason, every now and then? Complete uh, zero complete denial, zero payment on that thing? I would never know. Never know. I've, I've never seen that before. Never seen well, I'll tell you this. Um, there, there may be some good reasons why complete denials happen, and it, but I'll say, nine times out of ten, they're they're denials that can be solved. So, you know, I would recommend if you take a look at the reason codes at the bottom of those EOBs, that's going to be your first cue to mm -hmm. the denial. Um, most denials, hundred percent denials, are probably the result, at least on a work comp standpoint, of just lack of documentation or that authorization, right? Didn't get the authorization to treat, or you didn't supply any documentation to support the treat. Um, there may be a coding issue on the bill uh, that's causing the employer to deny based on compensability. Um, I know we have a clinical review team uh, at EnableComp that really focuses on those types of denials for compensability and coding. Uh, so I would recommend that for hospitals on the call, that you've got a good clinical and coding research resource within the hospital that's ready to kind of offer assistance on complete denials. Um, not, now, we published a blog on this on our website, oh, I guess a month or so ago, how to deal with professional review from the payer side um, that really gets into a step-by-step -step approach on how to deal with complete denials from the carriers because of a, a coding or a treatment denial. Question though. Okay, thank you for that answer. Our next question is, how does the lean process fit in? So, so the lien process is an extremely important part of securing your hospital's payment. Um, this sort of acts as a, a barrier between you and getting payment from uh, securing it to make sure that there's no other barrier between the two of you, so to speak. So whenever you have a, an MVA claim and you're putting out your lien, you're making sure that you have prioritization and that you're not gonna get left out of the table when it comes to uh, settlements. So it is an extremely important part. Uh, if you do not have a very structured uh, process, you are probably leaving out some uh, very important revenue on the table. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, the next question we have is, can we bill the work comp patient if the employer doesn't pay the bill? That's a good one, uh, and it's tempting. I know I'd like to sometimes, right? So when you get a small payment from a large work comp, uh, when you get a small payment from a large work comp bill, um, you know it's tempting to kick it straight to the patient. 
Um, that's against the law in most states, Georgia included. Mm -hmm. You can't do the balance billing. Now, if you have a complete denial, I'd probably refer to my question earlier about maybe taking a look at uh, some of the information that was missing uh, to find the root cause. Um, but, you know, just because it's a big underpayment, you really can't, you can't move forward with a balance bill scenario. You've got to look at your other options. Now, if there's a scenario where it is a work comp denial uh, and work comp is, is not um, not going to be part of it, then you may be looking at um, an alternative alternative liable payer at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, but straight out of the gate, no, you can't balance bill a patient uh, just because the employer didn't pay the bill if it's a bona fide work comp scenario. Okay, thank you for that answer. Our next question is, how do you define a successful settlement? So when you're looking at settlements, it's a little bit tricky because that is completely dependent upon your hospital and your organization's uh, threshold. So if you think that your settlement threshold is enough that you are not going to be upside down or losing money on that account, uh, it's going to be a high enough threshold that if you're hitting that, it's successful. Uh, if you want to go plus or minus a few percentage points, uh, that's entirely up to your organization's uh, decision making. Um, at the same point, at the same time, you might want to look at and see if getting that settlement is going to going to get resolve a troubled claim for you, so that if you no longer have to expend X type of resources to get this process or paid or pursued for another attorney or whatever, that might be in your best interest to get rid of it at that point for that amount of money. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, and the last question that we have is, okay, what if I'm a hospital on the border and treat a work comp patient who lives in a bordering state how do I keep up to date with the latest case law or statute that can affect our business? Well, I'll tell you, that's kind of a mixed question there. So if you're on a, if you're on a border state, uh, if you're, let's say you're on the border of Georgia and Alabama or Georgia and Florida, um, and you know, you're identifying that the jurisdiction is non-Georgia or maybe it's Department of Labor, what you want to do is is identify what jurisdiction that the payer is going to be paying based on. Okay, so you should know you should know your Georgia fee schedule. So when that payment comes in, it should match up to what you're expecting from a Georgia fee schedule standpoint. If the payer is paying on some alternative payment methodology, then I think you need to identify what it is. And most ELBs are going to say, from a work comp standpoint, uh, what the jurisdiction is. So if it's Department of Labor, then you know they're going to pay the Department of Labor a reimbursable amount. Um, if it's Florida, it's going to say probably in the jurisdiction somewhere on the EOB pay, paying the Florida amount. Um, a good way of identifying is if the payment methodology is vastly different than what you would expect from Georgia, uh, even the DRG inpatient reimbursement or the, or the table lookup on outpatient. So I guess the first thing you want to do is identify which jurisdiction is actually occurring. Um, and if a person lives in another state and they're taking that home jurisdiction, then you can identify which jurisdiction takes precedence. And so what we find is about 10% uh, of our claim volume for most of our hospitals comes from the non-home state jurisdiction. Uh, and if you're in Georgia, it may behoove you to have some information put together around how Florida jurisdiction works, um, how your surrounding states uh, pay. So when you have those out-of-state jurisdictional claims, you can give some direction to your billers for what to expect and adjust your reimbursable amount accordingly. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, that is the last question that I have um, that was listed. Do you all either one want to add anything? This is Ken again. I guess I'd like to thank everybody for their participation and the great questions. We had a lot of interesting uh, questions and answers going back and forth. And I guess to that point, my information is on the screen. If after we hang up, another question pops to mind, please feel free to email it to me, and I'll get it to one of my experts here to get a prompt answer back to you. So with that, I appreciate everybody's time. I look forward to the next uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Okay, I wanted to thank you for participating in today's webinar, and thank you, Allie, Ken, Jesse, 
and Jason uh, for sharing your expertise. It was very informative, definitely. And, you know, everyone in the um, this attending, just please feel free to contact, you know, Ken or any of the other speakers today should you have any further questions about their presentation. And uh, lastly, as, as you exit today's webinar, you'll be routed to a survey with three questions there. And one of those questions is very important because we want to make sure um, we have everyone's email address that attended. They may not have registered for the presentation, but we want to make sure they get their information so that they can obtain the CPE um, credits as well. Um, but I want to thank everyone for attending, and everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Goodbye.